to use the chat to ask questions uh, throughout. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll answer them pretty regularly. I'll also check the chat box. Yeah, excellent. So as I sort of said already, uh, today's goal uh, is that you'll learn why developing a really broad range of skills is really important. Uh, how to understand the skills you have and maybe also the skills you want to develop and then how to explain those, how to talk about those uh, with employers. So I'm going to start with the identifying your own skills before we get to really the question of employers. And I like to start this conversation by thinking a little bit about what skills actually are. Right, so skills are something we hear about a lot. Uh, it's an extremely common word, but I think we don't often pause to really consider uh, what they are and what we're talking about when we say skills. So a couple things. I think skills aren't the same thing as a credential. Right? Saying, you know, I have a bachelor's in computer science or I have a PhD in history uh, suggests some skills you might have but isn't actually a statement about your skills particularly. Right? And I think in academic settings in particular we can get a little bit caught up in thinking that credentials equal skills when actually they don't and it's on you to explain more robustly uh, what your skill set is and not just rely on your credentials. A skill also isn't just a bit of knowledge. Right? It's not the same as something you know. It's something you know how to do. Right? A skill gets applied and does something in the world. Right? You can also think of it as producing something. A skill has an outcome. Right? The, the something it produces may not be tangible. Right? So, you know, Woodworking skills may produce, you know, a table, right, which is a really uh, physical thing, but uh, strong skills in collaboration can produce uh, really effective uh, team dynamics, right, which aren't physical in the same way, but are just as much a product of those skills. Skills are also not fixed, I think most fundamentally it's important to remember that skills are developed through experience, right? That they don't stay the same and they are not inherent to you. I think we can often tend to talk as though they are to say, you know, I'm not a good writer, right? Or I'm bad at math, as if that's just a fixed statement uh, and that's never changed and is never going to change, right? And we all have different you know, capacities and tendencies, um, but we can all improve in whatever our skills are. I think it's also useful to think about skills in like big terms and small terms, right? A skill can be uh, something really high level, uh, really big like collaboration, right? But a skill can also be narrower. It can be something like, uh, being really good at talking to somebody who's upset and understanding like, what's really at the core of their concerns, right? That's a sub-skill in collaboration and is just as much a skill. Skills can also be uh, hard or soft. That's a language you often hear hard skills, soft skills. Uh, I don't really like that language for reasons we'll talk about. Uh, later on. Uh, I like to think about uh, as being some skills are technical, right? There's some skills are really specialized and other skills are uh, non-technical, right? Which can include a wide range of things like communication, uh, collaboration, uh, project management, etc. And they're all important as we'll talk more about later. Uh, I think we can tend to privilege or value uh, those technical skills uh, more. Uh, and I think that's a mistake for reasons we will get into. 
So in the graduate college, based on years of work with uh, graduate students and based on my years of experience teaching undergraduates as well, we've developed a framework for understanding the skills that students often develop here at the University of Illinois. And we've identified these six clusters, communication, uh, which we define broadly to include both you know, public speaking and writing, uh, but also uh, engaging in dialogue, visual communication, et cetera. Leadership and innovation, which is how do you lead people and ideas, right? management, things like that. Research and specialization, which is where those technical skills tend to live. Teaching and mentoring, which I want to really encourage you to think of really broadly. Right? That teaching is not just something that happens when you're standing in front of a classroom. Right? Teaching and mentoring skills are used anytime you are facilitating a discussion or guiding the work of another person. Uh, or offering feedback. Professionalism, uh, which know, has the most unassuming, kind of boring sounding name of all of these clusters, but it's actually one I think is really interesting. Professionalism is all about understanding contexts, particularly professional and social contexts, so that you can move within them uh, effectively. So, uh, oh, and then there's career management, very important to my job running a, uh, a career office. These are skills that help you uh, build and develop your own career over time, right? It's not just about, you know, resumes or cover letters. Uh, it's much uh, broader than that and useful for a very long time. So a good chunk of what we're going to do today is uh, little bit interactive or I have some uh, kind of things I would like to ask you to do. Right. So the first one is to consider these skills. Uh, let's say and fill out a worksheet that is available at https colon slash slash go dot grad dot Illinois dot edu slash RP interns, and I've just put that link in the chat. Right, and if you are in a room with more than one person, you could pull up one version um, on the computer if you'd like and uh, kind of think about it uh, since you're in the group. But for those of you who are on your own, I'd like you to go to that link, open the skills worksheet, and go through each of those skills. And I want you to put an X next to every skill on the list that you feel like confident in. You're like, I can do this, I have this skill. And in particular, I want you to add an exclamation point next to one or two skills on the list, just one or two that you think are your greatest strengths. And then, Try to identify three to five skills that you like really need to develop in, right? You know that they're important, but maybe you don't have, uh, you aren't as strong in them as you want and put a question mark next to those. So any questions about what I'm asking you to do? Okay, so I'll give you uh, a few minutes to download that and uh, look through those skills. Let me know in the chat if you have any questions or have trouble accessing. What do we put an X next to again? And I'm muted. Uh, skills that you feel confident in. So skills that you're like, I can do this, those get an X. Skills that are your greatest strengths get an exclamation point, and skills you really need to develop in get a question mark. Okay, if you're not quite done with that, you can uh, continue while uh, we move forward. Uh, I wanna emphasize that this 
list of skills is of course nowhere near exhaustive. It is not every uh, skill you might develop or might need. And in particular, as Laura uh, points out in the chat, it doesn't include uh, much in the way of technical skills. Uh, and that's partly a there are kind of logistical programmatic uh, reasons for that, that the range of technical skills to, uh, students develop are so uh, broad, it would be hard to capture that in a sheet like this. Uh, but also I think maybe even particularly in context like uh, Research Park, technical skills are one of the primary languages people use to communicate. And so I want to focus a little bit on the other skills you might get less uh, experience and feel less able to talk about really effectively. Okay, uh, if anybody has you know, thoughts or observations having uh, done that sort uh, or having gone through that worksheet, feel free to uh, put those in the chat, or if anybody wants to share one of their exclamation point skills, uh, your greatest strengths, please feel free to do that. I would be, I'd be interested to see that. Okay, so now you have one sense of what kind of skills you have. You may want to later this afternoon, sit down and catalog some of your technical skills as well. Right? Make a list of those uh, and the skills you need uh, and do a similar activity of figuring out well, you know, what is a greatest strength, what do you still need to develop in, what do you feel good about. Yeah, great. Cherish notices. I think this is great. A pattern uh, of a lot of exclamation points in one of the sections in communication right, and ties that to uh, maybe being an, an English major. Right? And I think that's actually uh, a good way to use this uh, worksheet is to look for patterns. So the easiest pattern is probably what of the clusters do you have the most exclamation points in? Right? But there may also be um, other questions you could ask, like where, what, what section has the most question marks, right? That could help you focus your development uh, a little bit. Or do all of your greatest strengths have to do with, you know, interacting with people, even if they're not in the same cluster, right? Or do all of your uh, exclamation points have to do with problem solving, right? That could help you figure out, uh, like a theme that could help you tell stories about what your strengths are, uh, which as I'm sure many of you know, uh, is not an uncommon interview question. But so having done that, uh, started the process of reflecting about what your own skills are, I wanna turn to think about what skills employers want and how to figure that out and then how to talk about your skills in a way that connects with what they want. So the National Association of Colleges and Employers every year surveys recruiters at uh, employers across the US and ask them, ask them what skills are necessary for success in their organization. Uh, and um, this data is from 2018. It honestly doesn't change terribly dramatically. Uh, and you can see the most commonly rated uh, option are critical thinking and problem solving and teamwork and collaboration, professionalism, work ethic, and oral and written communication, then leadership, then digital technology, then career management, then global multicultural fluency. Right. And I've put a yellow arrow next to all of the skills that might by some people be dismissed as soft skills, right? In order to really highlight how important uh, they actually are and particularly how portable they can be, 
that all of these organizations also want technical skills. They want the specialized skills they need, uh, you need in order to succeed in the role, but they clearly don't think those technical skills are enough for success. Another way of looking at this with some other data from NACE right, is the gap between the skill areas that employers say are essential in their role, and those are the kind of red pink bars, right? So for example, 95.9% uh, .9 of employers say oral and written communication skills uh, are essential uh, for roles in their organizations. But the blue bar, you see how they rate new hires in their company. They say only 41.6% are proficient in oral and written communications. Right? And you can see the gaps are pretty dramatic, particularly in those soft skill areas. Right? So people are getting hired, but it's a clear concern from employers. It's one we hear a lot right, that uh, new hires aren't coming in with the critical thinking skills they need, aren't coming in able to communicate effectively uh, in writing or uh, speaking. Right? And so hopefully this maybe also gives you a sense that if you can convince an employer that you have the technical skills, the specialized skills they want, and are effective in those non-technical skill areas, that gives you an advantage when applying for jobs, right? Because all things being equal on the technical side, right? employers, and we hear this from recruiters all the time, want people who can also interact with other people effectively and be strategic and manage projects well. Right? The technical skills are necessary but not sufficient. So why? Why do they value non-technical skills? I, I think one of the biggest reasons uh, is that non-technical skills, uh, particularly skills in communication and collaboration, are really hard to teach. And that's one of the reasons I, I don't like that hard skill, soft skill uh, distinction, because a lot of these are hard, right? Being able to really think critically about a problem, understand uh, its components, its dependencies, the uh, what might happen if you, know, you do X or Y is really hard. And managing a team uh, that has people in it who clash regularly is hard. Explaining complex technical uh, content to people who don't have training in that technical area is really hard. And so employers would really rather not have to teach you how to do all of that from scratch when they hire you. Right? And so they want you to come in with those skills because uh, they're going to be acclimating you to their environment, to the specific uh, you know, needs of the, the role and to some of the, the technical systems they'll be using. Uh, they want you to come in with those already because these non-technical skills are actually really crucial for making teams work, making them effective and efficient. Uh, and so it's good for a company's bottom line uh, to hire people uh, who can work well in teams and who can communicate, uh, particularly maybe between the technical and business sides of uh, what an organization does. And also, if they hire somebody with strong critical thinking and decision-making skills, who's really good at uh, guiding the work of people, that's a good investment on their part because that person can be promoted and that person can end up uh, managing other people, right? 
and there's less likely to be a kind of dead end or a cul-de-sac in that person's growth, right? And it's also an investment in yours, right? Um, that particularly past a certain point, you need these skills in order to advance in most organizations. And organizations benefit when they uh, promote and advance people who have these skills. So this kind of data is of course very general because it's surveys of all uh, recruiters in all sorts of different sectors. And I think it's a really good idea for you to start thinking about what employers want, both in the technical and the non-technical areas in uh, the kinds of jobs you're interested in, the kinds of companies, the kinds of organizations you want to work in. So ways that you can do that are, I think most of all, by talking to people. Do networking, do informational interviews, ask people who work in the field that you are interested in what skills are necessary to get hired and what skills are necessary for long-term success in that field. Right? You could ask what skills, technical and non-technical, do uh, companies like yours look for in hiring? I'm putting, nope. Uh, I'm putting in the chat a link to a uh, page on our website that has uh, information about doing those informational interviews, having those conversations with people. Uh, and I'm sending that particularly because it also includes a sample email that you can use to ask somebody you don't know to talk to you. It didn't work. Let me investigate. Ha, there we go. I forgot a piece. Uh, okay, that one should work. So there's an email uh, template on there that you can uh, use that's designed to be really easy for somebody to say yes to. Other ways that you can learn a little bit more about what skills uh, an employer really values uh, is social media, right? You can see uh, particularly maybe on LinkedIn, uh, but also elsewhere, what kinds of skills and accomplishments they celebrate, what kinds of news about employees are they sharing. Uh, and you can also use LinkedIn to, for example, if you go to a company's LinkedIn page, you can see who works there and you could go to their pages to kind of understand their backgrounds and the skills they may have developed. Uh, you could also use websites like Glassdoor or Vault to kind of dig into uh, what companies value. But I actually think a really useful, oh, I sent the new version of the link in a, uh, private message rather than the general chat. So there's the link to that page. Uh, I swear I'm on Zoom presenting things like every week and still uh, manage to mess something up inevitably. Okay. But lastly, I think one of the most useful places to look for skills and to understand what employers want is by looking at job ads because it's actually one of the rare places you will see an employer, an employer talk really explicitly about what skills they want, right? On social media, uh, on their website, you can kind of deduce and, you know, analyze what they're saying in order to see what skills they value. In job ads, they're just straight up telling you. And so what I want to do now is have us look at a job ad and practice, uh, extracting the skills they're interested from it. Well, uh, and so where you can look in a job ad, to just give you a little uh, what's up, is almost anywhere, right? These are typical uh, sections in many job ads. Most don't have every single one of them, but uh, a lot do. Uh, and you'll see skills, of course, in the qualifications or in the uh, 
you know, required and preferred skills area, that's where it's going to be most explicit. But I think it's also worth looking in duties and responsibilities, looking in the summary of the job to figure out what would this person actually be doing all day and what skills are really important for success there. Right? So to not just look in a qualification section, but to look more broadly. A lot of people tend to think of applying for jobs as being kind of like this image on the screen now, right? that uh, it's a process by which an organization finds the like, one person who fits perfectly into that organization like a puzzle piece, where it's really a lot more messy than that. Uh, and I, it might look maybe a little bit more like this. It's about finding an overlap between what they want and what you have, rather than finding, you know, uh, a job where you have every single one of the skills they say. So as you're looking in the job ad, I want you to be thinking about, you know, what is the overlap? Is the overlap pretty substantial? Right? Do I have a good chunk of these skills? Uh, and if so, maybe that's a good fit, right? And you can move on to thinking about how, how to translate those skills, right? I think there's a lot of uh, research indicating that people with more, uh, particularly uh, racial, socioeconomic, and gender privilege uh, will apply for a job uh, when the overlap between the skills they have and the skills the employer wants uh, is pretty small. And people with less of that privilege are more likely to wait until you know, they have close to every single skill mentioned. Right? And so I'd encourage you to not wait. Right? Don't wait for the absolute perfect fit uh, between the skills, but to really think about that overlap and whether you could substantively do a job. OK, so also in the folder uh, at uh, that go.grad.illinois.edu slash RP interns, you'll find a sample job ad, which is for associate consultant at a nonprofit consulting firm called Achieve Mission. And what I'd like you to do is read the ad, paying attention to what skills they want. All right, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, so what skills does Achieve Mission want? And you might also be thinking about how do those line up with the skills you identified uh, earlier uh, on the skills worksheet. So any questions or concerns about that? Well, let me know in chat if you uh, need anything. I'll give you could be four minutes to read at the ad. Also keep it on the screen uh, here too in case anybody has trouble with uh, downloading. Okay. So feel free to type in chat if you want to, to add anything in addition to what I'm pointing out. But question asked when we read this ad is, what does Achieve Mission want in terms of skills? What skills are necessary for success as an associate consultant there? Right? And so I see a lot of collaboration uh, experience. So work as part of a diverse team. Uh, you have here uh, this kind of leadership development piece down here uh, gets at that. There's also a lot of communication skills and a lot of different kinds of communication skills. So forging close relationships with clients and colleagues uh, is a kind of communication interpersonal uh, skill, but actually 
probably two different ones, right? The internal and external facing communication, this person needs to be able to uh, work on both, right? They need to uh, be able to you know, speak and write effectively, uh, including editing and presenting, which are again, sub skills there. Uh, I like this one, political navigation skills. So this needs to be somebody who understands how organizations work and is able to kind of move through them effectively. They're gonna need quantitative and qualitative data analysis experience. And there's a lot of project management too. I, I like how explicit this one is about, you know, juggling multiple demands, right? So not just you need this, but they give you a little bit of a sense of why you might need it as well. Uh, and then I always find this ad interesting because of this last one, which is, you know, unusual. I think you can also learn a lot about what matters to a company by maybe some of the less common uh, elements in their, their job ads. And this kind of humility and hunger to learn uh, is great. And there's even more skills that I didn't uh, get to. There's a lot going on here, but you can see how I went beyond the qualification section and sort of connected that section to some of the responsibilities uh, in order to answer the question. Okay. So once you figured out what skills you have and what skills they want, your job is then to translate your skills or make sure your skills are legible and understandable to uh, the employer. And so in order to, to do that, it can be useful to think about how your skills that you've used in particular contexts would be used in this new job, right? To really kind of visualize what it'll look like to use that skill in that new setting, right? Because maybe most of your leadership experience has been in, you know, running a student organization, right? And that's similar to, but also different from uh, managing a team. Right, of people who are going to report to you. Right? And so thinking about what are some of those differences uh, can help you explain it in a way that'll connect to what they're, they're doing. You really need to connect the dots. You should never ask a recruiter, uh, an employer to and take that time because uh, very often they won't. Right? Uh, Recruiters spend very little time with resumes, for example, before deciding whether or not something connects with them. And so you need to do this work. And so you might shift the language you use when describing your skills so that it uh, mirrors what's in the job ad and what is used in that particular sector. Right? So when I work with people with a lot of teaching experience, I sometimes shift to talk about that as training because it's similar, but that language is more legible and accessible outside of an academic environment. You might, instead of just talking about a group assignment and assuming everybody sort of imagines exactly what that meant in your particular situation, you talk about it in terms of collaboration and make that clear, right? Or uh, for scientists, sometimes talking about protocols in terms of processes uh, is useful. Uh, it's also explain, particularly if it's a skill that's unusual or one that you used in an unusual context, explain what you did. Don't assume knowledge uh, on their part. Okay. Uh, on the language piece, uh, I'm suggesting two tools in the chat, job scan, ugh, that should be jobscan.co, not .com, and Skillsinker uh, are two tools that mimic applicant tracking systems and help you see uh, alignment between the keywords in a job ad and in your resume. And so that can be really useful for helping you figure out where your language is veering off from what uh, the employer might expect based on the job ad. 
So let's look at an example of what that might look like in the context of a resume. So if we imagine this person was vice president of a student organization, uh, and this, this looks a lot like an early draft of a resume that walks into my office pretty regularly, right? Where it says, organized fundraiser, held meetings, ran club Facebook group, trained successor. It's asking the reader to do a lot of work to think about what skills were involved there, and in particular, how those skills might shift to a different context. Because if I'm hiring somebody uh, who isn't going to be literally organizing fundraisers, right? I might see this bullet point and just sort of my eyes glaze over, like, and I stop caring because like, this is not something I'm hiring somebody to do. So what do I care, right? So this person could improve this by translating those skills a little bit more and making them a little bit more explicit, right? To not write this just as a list of tasks, but as a description of how they used their skills. And so that might look something like this. Uh, depending on the job, right, you should always tailor uh, your materials for the job specifically, right? But organized fundraiser becomes managed year long $5,000 fundraising project involving coordinating diverse stakeholders, monitoring, monitoring progress, and competing deadlines. Right? And the bullet's a little bit long, but you can see it has one, like, scale. It's useful, right? Is Was this, like, a bake sale you, like, thought of on Thursday and ran on Friday, and that was it? Like, no, right? This tells them, no, it was more than that. I've used these skills really well. And it's dense with skills. Uh, so coordinating diverse stakeholders includes collaboration. The monitoring progress uh, gets at some of those project management pieces, right? Held meetings become something about close relationships. So let's say this person is applying for that achieved mission job, right? Uh, they wanna talk about how they built those in what kinds of contexts. And often you can show critical thinking and kind of strategic skills by including the why you did something, right? Show yourself thinking about how what you did connects with an outcome and that's showing you thinking strategically and critically. Uh, another version, uh, I had this is for like a job at a bank, right? But you could imagine, you know, uh, this working for a lot of customer service oriented jobs, right? Where you have like handling cash, right? Which if your job isn't going to involve or the, the next job isn't going to involve handling cash, is that going to be interesting to them? Or if they've never worked a kind of retail environment are they going to understand what closing responsibilities means and what it indicates about your skill and the trust your employer had in you? Uh, or closing simple interest loans, you know, again, narrows it down and doesn't highlight those skills. And so you might end up with something um, like this, right? So finalized loans in accordance with guidelines and policies to kind of demonstrate your ability to understand a policy and apply it, uh, right? Rather than just training new employees, right? You designed a process for doing that and include the why here. Okay, hopefully you got a little bit of a sense of how you might uh, do that. I think there are also great opportunities to uh, highlight non-technical skills alongside technical skills. So to include a little bit of context about how collaborative a technical project was in a bullet point or in an interview answer describing also the technical details of it.
right? so that somebody can see both your technical prowess and uh, your ability to work with other people. So this is an on your own uh, kind of thing, but I'll leave this slide up if anybody wants to uh, work on this while I also just open it to questions. If anybody has questions, feel free to type in chat, but I think it would be a useful exercise for you to do a little bit of thinking about uh, skills in general. As I said, do this for technical ones, but really think critically about what non-technical skills you've been developing in your internship, because you definitely have been developing them and you would under any circumstances, but particularly this year, I imagine uh, you've developed uh, strong skills in adaptability and flexibility, right? It's like that. And then you might practice, how do you talk about those skills with an employer uh, that you want to work for in mind? But okay, any questions in the chat? So Annie asks, how do you explain skills that you are still working on? For example, a programming language you are just learning. That is a great question. Uh, I think there are a couple, sorry, Annie, do you want to add something? No. Nah. <laughs> okay. Uh, a couple ways to think about that. One is, you know, resumes often include a skills section, right? And I get a ton of questions about when can you include something in a skills section or how do you, how do you, how do you manage that? Uh, and, you know, maybe unfortunately, there's no one answer to that because as I, I said, earlier, skills aren't, for the most part, a binary, right? It's not either you have it or you don't. Uh, and so a couple things. One, you always have the option in a skills section uh, of indicating level, right? I would recommend um, uh, usually not having like a bunch of options, but going with like basic, intermediate, advanced. Right or uh, intermediate and advanced, and using that to indicate the ones that you're, you know, you can do some things in. Uh, you also can think about the order you put things in the skills section. Often the the skills you're strongest in um, come first. Uh, but essentially, particularly with your resume, I would not put something on the resume you couldn't have a conversation about, right? So if, you know, you just started learning this programming language means you like, you know, watched a Coursera lecture about it and like opened the, the file to, to mess around with it, but you haven't really gotten there. That's probably not, uh, not something you want to put on there. You don't want somebody to be able to say, tell me about this and point to, um, you know, R, uh, and not be able to talk about it. But I wouldn't also wait until you feel like you're an expert. Um, and I think cover letters are a nice place to provide some context for something like that too, because you're learning on your own a programming language or realizing, oh, I need this. And so pursuing opportunities to uh, develop it shows off one, that you're developing that skill, right? And that you are, you know, enterprising self-starter that you're good at identifying needs and then filling them, All right? So a cover letter, an interview uh, could be a really good opportunity to actually tell a story about the development of a skill that you're not like super, super advanced in yet. Uh, Cherish asks, is it better to have an explicit skills section on your resume or to simply integrate skills into bullet points under your work slash volunteer experience? My recommendation is usually that you keep a skills section, like an explicit skills section, pretty narrowly focused on those technical skills uh, that are like, uh, because those sections are often used by uh, recruiters to kind of check boxes, right? For those like, does this person have the basic technical stuff? I wouldn't recommend probably having a skills section that is just like communication skills, right? Project management skills, because 
like what does that even mean, right? And integrating it into those bullet points lets you provide context. Um, Cherish, does that answer that question? Like, I think, I think always integrate, like even if you have a skills section full of technical uh, skills, you should also talk about how you use those technical skills in the bullets uh, because that's what gives context and depth and let somebody actually know that you've used the skill and not just taken half of a Coursera uh, class. So to Cherish's question, when can your resume move from one to two pages? That varies a lot by sector, but I've been seeing a lot of interesting research with recruiters uh, indicating that even for entry level positions, um, they are more likely to call somebody for an interview with a two page resume. Um, so, you know, if you have enough that is relevant, I think you can explore going beyond. Uh, character and personality in uh, the resume. I think mostly keep that to the cover letter, which again is the place you're telling the story about yourself. But I think in in small ways, you know, what you indicate you value by how you frame things in the bullet point uh, points can be a way to do that. But I think resumes, think of them more as like really procedural kind of documents and the cover letter uh, as a place to build on yourself. Or many resumes will often include a, a summary statement or a profile. And that's a place where you can kind of capture a little bit more of your style as you are summarizing yourself. Um, but otherwise, keep it relatively uh, straight to the point. Great, right. thank you, uh, Derek, for your awesome presentation today. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Don't forget to register for next week's workshop on networking in a virtual era. Um, I just dropped the link in the chat, so um, please register for that. Subscribe to the Research Park Summer Intern Newsletter. I'm gonna drop this link in the chat as well um, to get updates on what's going on here at the park, uh, workshops and events alike. The winner of the raffle will be announced through our Instagram channel tomorrow. So look forward to that. And please stay connected with us uh, for future events, announcements um, by following our social media.